we are talking about Katsetnik and his life. I don't know if everybody who is sitting here is knowing about uh, whom we speak. Maybe you can characterize yeah, um, the author of, uh, about, uh, about whom you talk in your film in a few sentences yeah, only. Of course, of course. So, um, do, you, do I need a mic? Or you can hear me? Please. So Mike is better because ah, Mike. Ah, yeah, yeah, oh, we okay. uh, record. So first of all, good morning. Sorry for running late. It was like all the city is under construction. I don't know if you noticed, but as an outside visitor, I can tell you <laughs> it's under construction. But it's nice and it's a beautiful city. So uh, no, not so good. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. Uh, so Katsetnik was a Jewish writer born in Poland, 1909. A uh, Holocaust survivor. He survived uh, Auschwitz. For he, he was in the camp for two years. After the camp, like 1945, he started writing right away, like he was released on January, and released his first poem about the war in April of the same year. So he was writing right away. And the unique thing about this character, about Katsetnik, that he had two identities, in a way, in order to cope with his post-trauma. He had a severe post-trauma from the war. So he kind of had multiple identities. One was Yechiel Dinu, an ordinary man, he had a wife, he had two kids. And the other one was called Katsetnik, the man from the Katset, the man from, from the concentration camp. And he was like, they, those two identities didn't know of each other in a way. It was really divided. Um, so this, the film tells the story of, of this writer and a very unique, um, how can I call it, like a meeting between Katsetnik and Dinu when those two identities had to realize that it's the same person, when he called to testify, what is summoned to testify in the Eichmann trial. And because he had to testify under his real name, he collapsed. He had a stroke on the witness stand, and he collapsed. Uh, and afterwards, and this is like the third part of the film, he went for LSD treatments in the Netherlands in the 70s in order to cope with his post-trauma and his split identity. And in the end, like and I will tell you the end of the film, but he kind of had really relieved himself from the symptoms of post-trauma. You can't cure, you can't heal yourself from post-trauma, but you can reduce the symptoms. And he had like a really um, amazing, I must say, and really meaningful change in his mindset about the perspective of the war and the outcomes of, of Auschwitz in a way. So this is like a small recap of his life. I, ask, I kindly asked you to describe this because we record it. Yeah. And uh, this meeting is also for outside people. Yeah, of course. It's, it's forever. Yeah. Um, uh, Naomi, can you describe how you met the project and how you met Asaf? Yes. Um, so Asaf and I went, it's a simple story, not a lot of drama in it. So we went to the same film school 25 years ago. Unbelievable. And uh, Asaf also worked uh, as an editor for many years and still is. And we worked together as a production, as producers and editor on six different projects. And uh, Asaf was obsessed with Katsetnik, which of course we knew who Katsetnik was in my house. And maybe we'll delve into that later. He was considered, uh, his films, uh, his books were not uh, accepted in my house, in my parents' house, because they were referred as cheap books uh, that uh, shows the horrific side of things in a mega dramatic, uh, exaggerated way, and it's not considered to be high prose. So when Asaf came to, to us with uh, this uh, idea, of course, I was very interested because I also knew that Katsetnik went through LSD treatments, and then I also started reading the books, and w I went through the arc that Asaf is also describing in the film. And uh, yeah, we've been working on it for like uh, six, seven years. You've been 12 years obsessed, and we joined in after a couple. And that's the story. Sara, you saw the film yesterday for the first time as a producer on this big screen, I guess. Can you describe your feelings? You, you're allowed to say it's a great film, so it is, it is up to you. I'll, I'll try uh, not to use too many uh, you know, good words of the film that I did because I'm, you know, I'm not that objective. But anyway, f for, for, for me, it was the first time I saw the film on a big screen, the whole film. And um, and as Asaf described, I, I was very proud of the simplicity that the film, uh, the, that the, the the way, the simple way 
that uh, we were able to tell the story and we were, we were struggled for years to be able to, to be so focused on the, on the intentions and on the story itself. And I won't tell you and I won't uh, say any spoiler now, but the end of the film for me is a meaningful statement for human beings. Okay, maybe it sounds very, very high concept now, and you know, uh, again, I'm not objective, but there's like a build up to the last sentence that uh, Kassetnik uh, you know, is telling in the only interview, uh, interview that he had with the Israeli television. And for that, I hope that as many people will, uh, that uh, will be able to watch it will do so because there's something. I'm not saying that we're going to change the world. I, I'm not from the, the, from the group that think that cinema can change the world. It can't. But it definitely can touch and definitely can show different angles. Definitely, definitely f open the mind for uh, different perspectives. And uh, I mean, if people will watch it, um, in Germany, in Israel, and outside of the of the two uh, origin countries, then it might do some kind of a different change because I think we live in a very very problematic times now. I guess all over the world, and uh, something really meaningful about what he's saying about us as human beings. I think we can um, point uh, out uh, this. Um Catharsis in the end of the film, uh, which is included in his sixth book, The Code. And it's also a comment from your side on the state of the mind, of the public mind, not of, <laughs> not of every Israeli woman and man, but some sort of widely spread mind, the, the state of mind in Israel, with which you are not completely satisfied, I guess. Maybe you can point yeah. out uh, this essence of your film. Yeah, of course. Um, like, I think we need to delve a bit into the, yes. the third part. We have part time. The, yeah, yeah, so we'll, we'll do it. Uh, under the LSD treatment, Katsetnik actually sees himself in the um, position or in kind of have the ability to imagine himself standing as an SS officer in Auschwitz and kind of changing places between him, one sent to death, okay, on, on that occasion, and the SS officer that actually is sending him to the crematorium right now, okay? And he can, he's able to see himself in that position as well. And he realized, for the first time, I think, he's in his life, as he describes it in his book, that we can all change places. Okay, this is the unique understanding or the understanding that he reaches in the end, in the last part of his life. He was in his <coughs> 70s. And, but I think he added another layer to it, which is, I think, even more important. Because many people, you know, some of them, of course, wrote and described this notion of we all have the ability to do evil. Okay, this is it's not unique. But he says something else, and he says, if I have to choose between being sent or being the one sending people to death, I'd rather be sent to dine, to death, again, okay? And I think this is a very clear statement that we need to, to look again and to, we live to, I, yesterday we talked about it and I said it's like a pillar of, of this morality, of this moral issue, of this standard that he uh, put in, in front of us. And he talks about, again, a high standard of, of morality, okay? That we talked about it yesterday a bit, it's not easy to get to, but we need to have this um, concept in front of us all the time. And I think in Israel and many other places, this concept wasn't well perceived. Okay, I think uh, his book is because he was a bestseller in Israel and worldwide. But the last book that he described this notion and described his LSD experience wasn't a bestseller. This is the only book he wrote that wasn't sold in millions, like the previous ones. And I think this notion, this understanding, this perception that he brings to the table, say, well, we all have the ability to do evil and good and we have to choose, wasn't real uh, perceived. Because I think it's easier for us to describe or to imagine 
the place we are living in. It not, doesn't matter where, and divide it into binary uh, understandings, like good and bad, black and white, okay? And I think he puts us in a different place. It puts us, Katsetnik puts us in a different place, puts us in a, in a more complex idea of how we should think about the place we live in. And I think nowadays, as I started to say, it's really, it, it's becoming important again, those values that Katsetnik poses before us, because it's not really about, it's, it's also about what we do in our normal life, like in daily life, but it's about where we, as a society, want to head. Where are we going? And I think now we're going to, it doesn't look good. I don't know where we're heading, but it doesn't look good all over. And I think we need to re-look at those events and the way Katsetnik, for me, describes them and to rethink about the path we are taking. So for me, it was very um, powerful to read these sentences that he wrote and to hear him say it in, again in the only interview he gave. Um, and I think it wasn't well perceived, again, here and, and sorry, in Israel and worldwide. So we need to take another look in, into this book, I think. Naomi, what do you expect from the presentation of the film at the Jerusalem Film Festival in a few weeks? Um, I like to see what happens. <laughs> I don't like to, you know, forecast okay. and imagine what, what, what's going to happen. But I think it will be interesting, mainly in the sense that Katsetnik, uh, even though he was a bestseller for certain years and was translated to many, many languages, he did disappear in Israel. The current young generation doesn't know of Katsetnik, even though three generations knew a lot about certain sides of Katsetnik. So I think one of the main things the film will do will revive him in the way. And I just want to add to that because the three of us were writing the script uh, together. Our main challenge was how to make a film about a person that didn't want to be out there, that wasn't exposed, didn't give interviews, wasn't photographered. We only had one interview of him and his testimony in the Eichmann trial. And I think our struggle was to give life to this person that was actually a bit dead during his life even. And uh, you both are living in Berlin uh, the whole time, so you decided not to live anymore in Israel. Sar, can you speak about this point? I mean, we can dive into it and tell you so many things. I mean, we have family, we, we are living together. It's not uh, Makes things easier. Uh, we, we basically, we moved to Berlin because we had at the time four uh, features in co-production with, uh, and we basically knew that we're going to stay, we're going to travel so much and we have two kids. So we decided, let's make it easier. Uh, and uh, as we, um, as we also have both of us European roots, so uh, with the European identity, so it's, um, um, it's it's easy for us uh, to travel in Europe, so we came and we basically we like the city and we continue. If you if you uh, refer to the to the politics in uh, in Israel now and, and definitely there's something that goes in every conversation in uh, on in the in a sub subtext and not as a subtext. Yes, we are very frustrated. Frustrated is a, even a very light word. Uh, you know, try to describe what, what we are feeling. We are disappointed, we are frustrated, we are sad. Um, and yeah, nationalism is, is hell. Nationalism always uh, in, in the history and in the present and probably will be in the future, will take us to, to the extreme, to, to our extreme uh, points where we are basically losing. It's happened in Israel. It's happened uh, in, in the US, it's happening here, it's happened all over, and that's something that, uh, and of course, we are related first to our homeland, and this is our homeland. It's, uh, yeah, so we, we move out of practical uh, uh, reasons, and we kind of stayed because we like the city. Also, I also like Munich, but you know, <laughs> I'm more a Berlin yeah, guy. Um, Let's talk again about the film, how you, um, the layers of the film. Uh, I can imagine, um, I know that uh, you worked 12 years on this project. Can you give us a short but <laughs> intense impression about how you edit the several layers? I can imagine that you started with the first um, 
the, the archive material. Yeah. And then you thought about how, how can I get an impression of his fantasy. So you slowly created this, uh, this uh, phantasmagoric uh, layer. And uh, one after each other. So, or did you plan, I, I cannot imagine that you planned 12 years ago how to make the film. <laughs> no, no, yeah. You organized it 12 years ago. Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm an editor, so we think ahead, but... Uh, you can but see it in the film, it's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll skip the, five, the first five years, because, since I, because I only began really working on the film since I met Sarah and Naomi, since I sat yeah. in their office and said... We need I mean, to the main it. layers of, the, uh, of how, you, yeah. how you compose yeah. your storytelling. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I agree. But w what I wanted to say that I think from the beginning we knew what we are not going to use in the film. That was the first understanding that we had. Like there is no quote unquote regular archive footage from the Holocaust in the film at all. We were certain about it for two main reasons for, for, for me at least. And I think we all discussed it. First of all, I think it's, it doesn't... Um, those shots doesn't have any emotional feeling uh, anymore for me, or I think for the viewers, because we all seen them like a million times now. Those famous shots that were shot in Auschwitz or by the Russian after the day after the, they released the camp, etc., etc. So I think for, for us as the viewers, it's really hard to look at this, at this fo archive footage and re feel and anything, okay? So I think. We knew we can't use that. And, and the other thing is, for Katsetnik, I think those people in the camps weren't Holocaust survivors. They were neighbors and, I don't know, cousins and the guy that, I don't know, he met in the synagogue, okay? And we want to portray those people as human beings again. Like, I want you, the viewers, and us, the filmmakers, to look at those people as human beings again, not Holocaust survivors, not people that came out of Auschwitz after a few years. So we knew we're not going to use those. So that was another obstacle that we took upon ourselves. And then we had to decide what should we do? Because as Naomi said, we had no archive footage of Katsetnik. We had no photograph of him when we began. And then we decided to go uh, search for something else. And I was looking, I think we all discussed it, this uncanny feeling of something because the the film deals with subconscious okay the lsd uh, treatments of course is dealing with the mind and katsetnik's uh, feelings and katsetnik's emotions are brought in the film so we needed to talk some tool some cinematic tool to talk about this notion to talk about the mind and the cgi the computer generated imagery which is like a computer animation in a way brought with him this uncanny feeling that you look at something and you can't really describe whether or not you're looking at reality, okay? So you kind of looking at the screen and you say, it looks like Auschwitz, but I know it isn't in a way, and it brings with him this notion that's kind of a dreamy-like for me, okay? So we knew this, but I'm kind of... I'm shortening a very long process, so I can deal into it a bit again. Not animated. This is yeah. Point. Not like an animation. We, we saw it already yeah. as, as well, in a very yeah. brilliant way from Israel, by the way. Yeah, they did. Um, so we need to, and, and again, we needed to do something new. That's as a cinematic language. We, need, we wanted to do something like that wasn't done before or all done in, in, in other uh, genres, in a way. So... Um, but we, we went through a process, like we first thought about building this tiny maquette of uh, like curtain made um, infrastructures, really detailed and really realistic um, designs of, of, of the camp and to shoot with a tiny camera inside. We didn't. It was unpractical in so many levels, but we needed to, s to find a way to tell the story. So this computer generated imagery was way that we found in the end, but it was a process. And then, as we delve into the research as well, we kind of find, because we knew we had to get closer, as Naomi said, to this dead person. He was out of sight, out of mind in a way, and he died 2001, so it was a very big challenge. So we were looking for letters, we were looking for diaries, we were looking for things he wrote about himself, letters that he sent people, or he, sent, or he was given, or he was addressed to. So we kind of wanted to 
walk in that path. And then we had all the material in the editing room and we started step by step actually with my amazing uh, editor wasn't here, we edited together. Um, to find a way to stay focused on, on the man, on the man's mind, like Katsetnik's mind. Like everything that was like out of the main path for us went away. Like there is so many stories, so many good stories, so many good scenes that are left out because they weren't on the main path, this path that follows Katsetnik's two identities and Katsetnik's mind. So this is how we kind of started to collect those tiny bits, like, okay, this is a sentence that he wrote just after he collapsed in the Eichmann trial. Okay, this is a letter he wrote to his wife. This is a love letter. This is something that he, I don't know, a photograph that was taken in his wedding. This is a story that we hear about, and I think we, it lights a certain side of his personality. So everything was kind of connected together, and we added this layer, of course, of CGI at the top of everything. And that was a process as well, because we began with just making shots of the camp itself, of the concentration camp. And then we realized we needed to have a character in the film that to portray Katsetnik himself. So we brought an actor. And it was like a process that kind of involved over, again, a course of a few years, till the end, uh, till we reached the final version of the film in a way. And the off voice, how did you choose it? Because this is a dif difficult point. Yeah, uh, again, it was very, like, in the end, actually, it's the actor that is playing in the film does the narration. It's not narration, but the voice acting. Um, but it wasn't meant to be this, like, it wasn't, we, w we weren't sure that it was going to be the same person, but it was in the end, the same actor. Um, we wanted someone, we knew from the beginning we weren't going to imitate Katsetnik's voice. And to, his, he had an accent in Hebrew because he was born in Poland. He speak, his main language was Yiddish, of course. So we knew we are not going in that path. It's not like doing imitations and going, doing, I don't know, reconstruction or reenactment of his, his, of his life. So, but we were looking for someone, someone's voice that we can feel that he has gone through intense things. Okay, so he had like, I don't know what the actor had, begin, had gone through in his life. I, don't, I know him just a bit. But I can feel in his voice that he has this sense that something went wrong in a way, but he kind of overcome it. So he can feel it in his voice. And for me, it was very important because I wanted someone that can, in a way, bring Katsetnik back to life. And I knew Katsetnik's voice from, from the interview he gave. And I knew you can feel it in why, by the way he talks, by the way he pronounces himself, that is, you can see the post-trauma, you can hear it in a way. So I wanted someone with the same quality, and I think we managed to find someone which is quite close to this. He's not a Holocaust survivor, of course, but he brings really the unique quality to the film. Did you, during the process, add some layers which you eliminated? Can you remember something? No? Because, uh, I think yeah. we had a big uh, dilemma how to use what did exist, how to use the pictures of him and the interview of him because there were certain versions, okay, you know, you're tempted to show him on screen quite quickly so that the audience can relate. But then we decided to go some kind of a linear path with his conscience, and when he was revealed to show himself, that's the point when we'll show him in the film. So the first time he was not willing to reveal himself was when he was summoned to the Eichmann trial, and of course he collapses. So we went through the collapse with him, and only eventually, when he gave his first interview ever, it was the first time we really see him on screen. It's exactly the, the right thing for me as a viewer, because it, uh, it's according to the process he made for himself, so he can be identic with himself at that point of the film, of the dramaturgy. Exactly. Yeah. And all the elements were there to serve this, this uh, way of conscience. So that's why also using the people interviews, there are scholars that really understand his work. So they can you know, give us insights of his conscience. So all the elements together were there to serve you know, this conscious line, trying to understand what Katsetnik Ichiel Dinur went through in his literary arc that eventually led to his final conclusion. I think his book, uh, his books, uh, might be, might be uh, read uh, in, a, in a in a frequent way after the screening of your film. It it, it couldn't be uh, it couldn't be different, isn't it? Yeah, actually, actually, they're out of print. 
this is the said stuff, said part of it, sorry. They can, f they can be found in secondhand shops and stuff like that, but they're out of print for unknown reason for, in my perspective. Okay. So it's a bit difficult to get them, but if you won't make an effort, I think it, it's worth the effort. Uh, but I think, yeah, looking at it, because as, Katset, as, sorry, as Naomi said, yeah, as Naomi said before, for her, in her family, Katsetnik was banned. And for many houses in Israel, Katsetnik was banned because he wrote cheap literature, he wrote books that were unsophisticated in any way. And I think many Israelis brought, were, were, sorry, were, um, were given this notion, given this idea that Katsetnik is something of the past. Okay, he's... Can I contradict? Yeah, of course. I think it was actually a, a minority that banned his books because they saw something indoctrinating in them. Yeah. That the educational system in Israel also realized that in a point, yeah. and that was they were also distributed to soldiers in a certain point. So it, I think it's actually the vast majority of Israelis at the time did read Katsetnik, but in very uh, a small portion of the society kind of saw these books as something. If we want to heal and not be like, uh, I'm exaggerating by the phrase, but like eternal victims, and we want to heal and to be like healthier people, we shouldn't read these books. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like the 90s. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit, but, uh, sorry, in the later stage, like today, like the name Katsetik doesn't mean anyone, anything to anyone in Israel. Like men, like a few people can, can identify the name. I think the phrase that he coined, the other planet is still very much in use. The, no, the, the concept himself, he talked about Auschwitz as the other planet, a place outside of human perspective, outside of human understanding, where there are like demons and victims. So this is the way he portrays Auschwitz at the beginning. After the LSD, of course, he changed his mind and he returned from the other planet. This is the film in a way. Um, but I think this notion, this concept is still very powerful in Israel, okay? But his books and his writing and his, I don't know, journey is a bit forgotten or forgotten at all. But I think reread those books after you see the, the, the film gives them a different light because now, because when you understand this is a man writing his trauma, this is a man in severe post-trauma that should be treated that's, that's the reality of it. He was, like many other Holocaust survivors in Israel, he was overlooked. No one thought about Holocaust survivors as post-traumatic people, which they were, actually. This is the main, like, this is, should have been the starting point. Those people had post-trauma. No one talked about it. They talked about how brave they are, how difficult their life was, but no one talked about post-trauma until the 80s or the 90s. And read, read these books in another perspective, read them, like, think about them in that perspective of a man portraying his own trauma, I think gives them a new light and new understanding that I think the Israeli society didn't went through. Like those books was either written as a memoir, as an, an, a writer telling his experience, or as an decorating um, piece of art in a way, like, okay, you should read it, and then you should do one, two, three, okay? But no one look at the basics of, of this book. It's men with post-trauma. And if I just may add an interesting fact that until the Eichmann trial in the 60s, Holocaust survivors, survivors were overlooked in general. Yeah. It was, it, you know, people were looking down at Holocaust survivors in Israel as weak people, people from there, not the new strong nation. So the Eichmann uh, was also pivotal in that. And therefore, rereading the books with this notion is also quite interesting. Yeah. Maybe finally, one point which was very impressing yesterday for me. Um, Daniela, his um, daughter, participated at the screening with her wonderful husband, also a kid of Holocaust survivors. Um, and she said to me, um, what I didn't know, we already discussed the point yesterday, um, that every scholar from a certain age, I guess age of 16, in Israel is forced to do the Auschwitz tour. And uh, she has a big problem with it, to say it carefully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she said, um, the pornography of terror is in her eyes the wrong way to handle the destiny of Israel. 
um, maybe you can we, we can speak about this point. Yeah, I think Katsetnik, okay, Katsetnik, um, for those who haven't seen it, but probably you heard from all of us, is, is a man, basically, he creates out of trauma. And um, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm positive if it, even, that Israel is, is a country under trauma, still. Under trauma of the World War II, under trauma of the history before, the history after, what going on, what going on now, I'm not trying to justify, although I'm a citizen also of, um, of Israel. But in a way, there's all kind of approaches how to deal with the trauma. One of the approaches was let's send those um, youngsters to, to the death camp to see where, where that all starts from. I basically, I never, I, I also grew up in Israel. I wasn't there. Me neither. At, at my, uh, at I my generation, I don't there were, I was born, you know, at the end of the 60s. I don't remember that uh, it was common. It starts later. I assume it is related to the right wing, wing uh, agenda towards dealing with the history, which in every aspect, doesn't matter if it's the left wing or the right wing, it's always come out of this trauma because this trauma is not something that left, uh, that is not in us or not in the country. And sometimes it makes us do, uh, the, the Israeli people do uh, um, the, the good and the right thing and sometimes the the wrong things, but it's all, I guess it comes from there. It's a trauma that's not ends. So in a way, yes, I also see it as a kind of pornography, although I'm sure that the, there should be a way to keep it living within the Israeli society and within the, the global society, because what happened and 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 Kassetik went through a process, as Asaf described, demons and the victims. No, it's not demons and the victim. It's people and people. People push the button. Nobody else. And it's uh, it's happened here, uh, 80, 85 years ago. It's happening in Rwanda, uh, 30 years ago. It's happened definitely in in, in Bosnia. It's happening. It can happen again. And that's something that I think, and that's something I'm carried with, that we should be aware. Now, maybe, I don't, I guess that if we talk about this, uh, this two, those, I would say, travel trips to, to the death camp, I guess for, for my perspective, for most of the, of the kids, it doesn't work, but some, for some of them, it, it is because you know some of them doesn't know what really happening. The kids that now in Israel they are 16, they born 70 years after the um, the um, 65 years after the end of the war. It looks very far, although it's not. So it's um, I I I say I'm I understand what these things are happening. I'm not ag I'm not agree with, but I understand where it comes from. I mean. So if, I don't know if it's uh, answered the question. I wouldn't ever have dared to think about this uh, expression as a German. So I was so surprised that Daniela talked about this ex expression. And I, I'm curious what you think about it as a German. For me, it is absolutely I'll, prohibited to even think about in this context. about I, f I speak about pornography of terror in films, yeah. uh, but, but you not know, in, the, in a, this is historic context. But you know, we as Israelis were also very cynical because the, the Holocaust is also sometimes exploited for political reasons. And that's why we do have a discourse about it a lot. And it's I think it's you know it's a crucial thing for Israel to have a discourse of it. And maybe it's still right that as a German you don't uh, feel uh, comfortable to say uh, por pornography about the, the Holocaust. I don't know, it's also an emotional thing how you feel. but. Personally, I don't believe in these trips. I think people should uh, look at what they do to others and not what is done to them. Meaning I think that many people have to see the, or should be aware of the camps as a universal crime against humanity uh, and not an Israeli Jewish thing only. So I don't think also 16 years old could really grasp, I still can't grasp 
I think many of us can't really grasp the magnitude of this thing. So as a 16 full of hormones kid that goes abroad for the first time and has to see a death camp after a death camp, I don't know how you even process that. So, and don't forget that two years after you're going to the army, it's mandatory. So you're all, you know, uh, triggered with like, you know, this will never happen again, but then you translate it into the army, which is a whole different thing. So I don't think these trips are healthy at all, but I do think uh, they're there with, with a very um, pre-designed reason. I, I want to add something because it reminds me of a story. Um, Hannah Arendt, you remember Hannah Arendt, of course, the Jewish German oriented, uh, the origin uh, Germany. Um, she, of course, flew to uh, the United States, I think, beginning of the 30s. And she, told, she, told, she tells this story that once she was in this party and people approached her and with a very sad face said, Oh, I'm very sorry. I'm ashamed to be German. And she said, I'm ashamed to be a human being. And I think it's a great story because I think it really points to something really important because it's really easy and we sit here of course we're in Germany three of us are Israeli born and we're Jewish of course so the relations is already intense in a way but I think and this is what the films is all about and I think this is a main point for me to do of doing this film because there has this concept this notion the Holocaust and everything that has to do with the Holocaust I think has a bigger um, understanding that should be brought in a way. I'm not really keen about looking at the Holocaust and trying to get re resolutions or try to get results or understandings, but we need to remember in a way what happened in Auschwitz, not as a concept of, okay, let's remember, but as a way of rethinking about where we are going. And I think she, Hannah Arendt, in that, that case, points to something really important because she talks about it's beyond nations, beyond where we were born or what identity we carry. It's about being a human being. And I think we tend to forget those issues. Like we sit here today, we talk about you know, human being and, and the situation, and people are being gassed to death in Syria right now. People are being, I don't know, butchered in China, and et cetera, et cetera. So like, situation is really like, and we all sit here and our government is making business with the Chinese government and your government is making business with the Chinese government. So, so it's, a different, it's a complex issue to deal with, but I think we should all, I, I try to remember and to see how can it, I don't know, change my perspective or rethink about things we're doing on a daily basis. So I think it's really, yeah. The return from the other planet. Thank you very much, Sar. Naomi and Asaf for bringing this film as a world premiere to Munich. We are more than proud and honored. And now we go to the next screening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Thank you.